And with that, we are going to go into our music sync panel, a continuation of a conversation we had uh, in a previous wavelengths and one that we found so uh, enriching and informative, definitely a place where uh, for opportunity that um, feels untapped uh, or at least less tapped uh, than other areas in the global music uh, community. Um, so today we're so excited uh, to be joined. I, I'm saying excited too much, but I really am just so excited uh, about today's uh, panels. But uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Josh Briggs from Terrorbird Media and Ali Sachedina from Geo Salon, uh, who I think are being highlighted as I speak. Um, Josh uh, comes to us from Terrorbird Media. Like I said, he's the general manager and head of publishing there uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, he, you know, everything from punk rock bands, college radio, indie music, you know, really just so uh, many touch points. Um, and reading his uh, CV is very exciting and definitely makes me want to create uh, just a Spotify playlist to uh, just rock the day away. Uh, and Ali uh, is a great supporter of Global Fest and someone who's been in our orbit for uh, many years and, and excited to have him join this conversation as well. Um, he's also the general counsel and business affairs uh, person at GeoSpawn, which uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing correctly, but it is uh, South Asia's largest digital music streaming service. Yeah, it's um, GeoSavin. GeoSavin, yeah. I'm going to say that. GeoSavin. Uh, Geo uh, so apologies for that. Uh, and it's used across the globe, 45 million tracks, 15 languages. Uh, truly an amazing um, resource. Um, and so we're excited to hear from them today about um, Music Sync and continue the conversation that we've been having over the last uh, 12 months. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. This is tremendous. It's also so great to catch the end of the last uh, panel and hear a really robust conversation about uh, allyship and collaboration, which I think extends to this conversation as well. Um, and so really excited to hear from all of you too. We're gonna to try to leave as much time as possible for Q&A. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll, um, Scout from Global Fest will be um, kind of, Com you're compiling those for us and, and we will we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. So, um, and somebody please shut me down if I'm talking too much. That's always, that's gonna be the thing. It's, it's, Ali and I did as a like pre-pro pre for this panel. I, I think we ran through an entire panel's worth of conversation just uh, talking amongst ourselves. So we yeah. definitely wanna hear from you and make sure there's plenty of time for that. And um, I think part of the aim of course is not to get too into the weeds. So we're, are we uh, playing a set sort of a, a general primer for everyone, uh, sort of to ensure that everyone's on the same playing field, at least in so far as understanding the basics of what publishing is all about. And please excuse uh, if we're insulting anyone's intelligence or experience here, apologies. And then uh, Josh, I think we were gonna talk about getting your house in order. Was that, is that correct? Are we still sticking to yeah. that? Awesome, and then yeah, just to, um, and, and then get into the opportunities that uh, are there in the music publishing space, especially in, with regards to sync, uh, and some of the things to watch out for, and things and opportunities in, that are around there. And again, please throw questions into the chat. We will, we'll, you know, we'd rather address the pertinent issues that you're facing uh, rather than just us speaking in uh, sort of an abstract and linear. So please. Uh, Josh, do you want to start ahead with the uh, Pub 101? Yeah, for sure. So um, we're publishing, as you all probably are very well aware, it's kind of like music business grad school. It can get really hairy really quickly. And it also changes country to country. You know, so I think especially with such a great international representation here, it makes even less sense to go deep into the weeds. So we're going to talk about something as the focus of this is really on sync licensing going to focus mostly on that. Um, if there are issues that are, you know, coming, they're coming up that go beyond that scope, we'll see if we can touch on them too. But this is going to be the basis of it. I think especially as um, the panel description illuminated too, that like the importance of sync income um, now, especially with travel restrictions and health concerns, limiting people's ability to make money from other means. Uh, but meanwhile, there's this incredible diversity of storytelling of, uh, street, uh, especially across streaming services, a rabid uh, appetite for 
new content and uh, fortunately along with that There's pitching their music to those types of um, projects. It's awesome for us because it means there's more artists to be pitched to more projects, which means more songs get licensed. It's less um, less myopic, less um, homogenized, and um, you know, and can really be an important piece of that income. So again, to make sure everyone's starting on the same page, we're just going to do a, a really as quick as I can an intro to sync licensing. So. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and everything. Okay. Um, all right. Can you see me? Yeah. Loading. Got this. Clever. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about syncs. Don't be scared. If this is something that's new to you, if this is something that's old hat, just um, play along. So um, What's it called when a song is used in a film, TV show, trailer, ad, promo, podcast, video game, anything else? It's called a sync. It's called a placement. You may have even heard it called a license or a sync placement, right? There's a bunch of names and these are all the same thing. It's a sync, right? And so why is it called that? I can't answer the question about why we haven't decided on what's one thing to call this. But uh, the reason why is because the music is being synchronized to picture, right? It is being synced. Um, and so that is, it comes straight from US copyright law. And that's, you know, that's how we get to that, that particular language. But the shorthand of sync is about synchronizing music with picture. Um, and to further confuse it, it does apply to audio only podcasts. Um, you can kind of think about it if it's, especially when um, it also applies to on-demand service, you know, on-demand services in that way. Uh, when you're combining uh, and sort of making what you call a, um, what you would call a um, derivative work, you are, you're taking a piece of a song and applying it to other audio, that's also going to be a thing. So in that case, and and for those of you who create TikTok videos, uh, you're, it's a synchronization, right? So basically TikTok yeah. goes to the labels and says, hey, you know, we'd like, you know, we need to get the right to assign to our users, the right to use, to synchronize video and audio. And that's a TikTok, you know, typical short form video and audio. That's right. So even if you just received a takedown notice or <laughs> been able to make them without, <laughs> without interference, that's why it's because there's a deal has been made. So the, we call this, this, this corner of the industry is called sync licensing or licensing. Um, so even what, like what is Terrorbird in this instance, we, we would be a licensing agent or a licensing company. Um, and because we represent these rights to, you know, and pitch them to the music supervisors and that kind of thing in order to make things happen. Um, so that's because productions, Film companies, ad agencies, they have to ob obtain official permission to use a song in a project. That's one of the rights of copyright in most countries is that they have to obtain, um, they, have to, they have to have the, the permission of the rights holders to get, to be able to combine this with another thing. Because as I mentioned, it's, it's, if you think of it as a derivative work, like a remix would be or anything else, um, it makes sense that the creators of that work and the owners of that work would have some say about where it goes and how it's used. Um, and so just like you need a license to drive, legally speaking, uh, you, films, ads, and games, they need a license for each of the songs they want to use in their projects, legally speaking, of course. It still happens where sometimes people use things without permission and copyright law provides legal recourse um, in most instances to make that right. So, um, and so what rights do these productions need and who do they get them from? That's like, I, you know, I think that is like a big question that people have. There's a lot of confusion sometimes about like, how can I grant these rights or who has that authority? Um, and they have to be, uh, they have to clear those rights to use. The two rights that they need are the right to the master recording and the right to the composition itself. Um, these are two different copyrights. Um, um, in in the U.S., it's a it's a sound recording copyright for that 
master and a performing art uh, uh, copyright for the composition. Um, and so because those are two pieces, they're two copyrights, two pieces of intellectual property, um, those, are, those are two separate rights that need to be cleared separately. Um, so because you, know, you have to get one for the master and one from the composition, uh, it's important to remember in your head what these, the difference between these things. I often hear artists call things like, oh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll call it the mechanicals or you get these terms confused. There's a lot of things again in this world that sound very similar. But when we're talking about licensing, we're talking about licensing the master recording and licensing that composition. So it's important to remember the difference between each of them. Um, so the master recording refers to that literal audio recording that's being used. It's the part you can hear, right? Um, so you could have two songs and two different recordings. There, so that means there could be two owners of those two different master recordings and still one owner of that song underneath. Um, so the name of the license that covers the use of that master recording is called a master use license or a master license. Um, and so you may remember these little guys, a composition notebook, uh, or all black and white friends for any of the creative writers in the group. Um, that is, so it's a good kind of mnemonic for remembering that that composition refers to lyrics, melody, chords. It's the part that you can actually write down. Composition, a composition. Um, even when you haven't literally written it down, it's still a composition, right? If you can hear unique lyrics and melody in a recording, that is in itself a unique composition. Um, so, and for so the name of that license that covers that use of the composition is a synchronization license or for short, a sync license. So right there, you're probably noticing, we call this whole thing sync, but then there's this one actual thing that is called a sync license. And that is only the license of the composition. So that can get people hung up too, but don't just, don't get bogged down. Just remember anytime you're licensing a song for sync, you're gonna have to license the music and lyrics and the recording. Um, so we at Terrorbird, as I mentioned before, we represent artists, songwriters, and record labels. Um, art, circle these in blue, <laughs> color coded them for you. Artists and record labels own, tend to own and control masters. Songwriters can, tend to control that sync side, the composition side. Uh, artists can assign, the, and if you write a song today and you have no record label and you have no publisher, you are both, you own both that master and that composition. You can assign those rights to a record label for your master or a publisher uh, for that composition. Um, and so like at Terrorbird, record labels bring us on to represent full catalogs. Artists bring us on to rep either full or partial catalogs, depending on the kind of music they make. You make, uh, you might make traditional music that um, maybe there is no known, you know, there is no known composer. So everything is public domain. In that case, you're probably only bringing us on to represent your masters. Or if you do uh, only, you know, cover versions of famous songs, you might only bring us on to represent your masters. Or uh, you might uh, bring us on to represent both if you have a mix of both of those things. Um, record labels typically only control master rights. And as I mentioned, artists can control either. Um, in many cases, a record label will control masters that embody compositions written by an artist. Okay, and so um, those are those can often be the they can feel like the same thing when the performing artist themselves is also the songwriter. Um, if, but if that artist is also the songwriter, that means that artist controls those sync rights. Um, I already kind of went over this. Um, there's the, uh, so we were at the sync side when the publisher is either controlled by either Terrorbird Publishing, as we mentioned in intros there, we're also a publisher or that artist directly. Um, and the only time we can't rep that synchronization side is if a composition is controlled by another publisher. As I mentioned, maybe a cover song um, or just a songwriter who's already signed, uh, has a signed agreement with another publisher. Um, and, and I'm gonna skip those things. This is, I just wanna like quickly review a master Master recording is performed by an artist controlled by a record label and a sync is the composition 
that's written by a songwriter and typically controlled by a publisher. Um, you can be your own publisher. You can be your own record label. There's no problem there. Um, those are your rights. Anytime you write a song, you're bringing a copyright into existence. You become an intellectual property owner. And so you, those, all the rights and entitlements of copyright are yours, even without registering your song with a copyright office. If you're in the US, you, uh, you still are entitled to all those benefits. Um, mm -hmm other than the ability to sue for certain damages, but you, you are protected. Your song is protected, your recording is protected. Um, and as a result, people can't just then use your song without permission in one of these audio visual uses. Um, and the hope is that they will want to, and they'll want to pay you money for it. Um, so with that, I, uh, oh yeah, this is one other jargony thing that I wanted to mention. Master side and sync side, we might call that both sides. If we're repping, both of those things, or, or let's say you are the controller of your own, you're, you control your master and you control your own publishing, you would be considered to a music supervisor or someone else who's looking to use one of your songs, you would call that music a one stop, meaning they only have to make one stop to clear both that master and sync, okay? You might still have to go talk to your four co-writers and your partner who you run a little record label with and all that, but they only have to make one stop in order to get those approvals and get a sign off in order to get a license. And that can be a very valuable thing, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, and I'm going to stop the screen sharing there because I think this is like a point at which, unless Ali, you had other things to add. To no, that, that was overview. Um, super on point. It was awesome because it simplified what was otherwise extremely difficult to explain sometimes. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it's really, it, that was really was solid and it also raised a number of great questions um, that you know uh, with regards to the importance of understanding of like if you're an independent artist if you're an artist manager your art as your client has created a new you know a, a full-length album doesn't have a label doesn't have a publisher is going to self-release it on you know through cd baby or like or self-release it yeah and get it onto all the streaming services what how important is it to get like what do we what should this independent artist do in order to maximize potential revenue to make it make that particular recording whether the master side or the composition attractive for licensing purposes um and there was actually a question that kind of popped up in in the chat that it, it sort of you know it lends into like you know if you want to get paid what should we do like where, where how should we, how should an independent artist or any artist for that matter get, uh, and especially one that's not affiliated with a publishing company or an admin company like yourself, what should they do? What are the, what are the important steps and at what point should they begin initiating? And my experience having represented independent artists and creatives for quite a few years as a music lawyer was that, uh, you know, when two artists get into, into a room, they start creating music, and the last thing they want to do is have, you know, the, the lawyer or the manager, you know, whisper over the shoulder, hey, get your paperwork sorted out. It kind of takes the <laughs> momentum out of that creative process. But at, at a certain point, that paperwork does really need to be uh, really set out. And Josh, would you like, what, from a, what, what are some of the key things that you've, like pieces of paper that you'd say, wow, that is, this artist has their house in order, so to speak. What are the things that you typically characterize oh. having a household order? If you don't oh, mind, I know you've you more lived in this world as well. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I used to work at ASCAP also. So it was, a, it was something that would come up a lot. And oftentimes with artists before they'd really made a, a penny and they'd be getting in an argument, or more so it's like once money comes into the picture, all of a sudden there's an argument about who wrote what and everything else. And so it's much easier before any money at all has come in, as uncomfortable as it can be to talk about money and ownership and who did what to do that, right? Like that you can, um, before anybody's trying to license your song for an Apple commercial or a Netflix show or something else, it's like understanding that ownership of these rights lasts you for life of copyright, which in most countries is, is the lifespan of the longest living songwriter plus 70 years. And it's up to a hundred years in some territories. So like it's, it's, legit important. It's your family farm as a songwriter, as a creator, like, right? This is the thing you actually get to pass on. You don't get a 401k as a songwriter. 
you get copyrights. So like, it's important to take them seriously. And so sometimes, and there's, but the thing is, right, there's no, as Ali and I talked about off screen, it's like, right, there's no, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, so the important things to look at when it comes to a sync is like splitting up those rights, right? Like you have that sync side, that's who wrote what. And then you have the master side, who owns that recording? Um, you know, typically if it's a, if it's a, like a, an artist, you know, if, if Ali's putting out a record and he and I write a song together, but he's going to release it under his name or an artist name, I would only get some of the sync side. Ali might own the master. If it's an independent release, though, we might split both sides equally. We're kind of like, this final recording is the one we're doing together, and we both kind of laid it down in the studio together. We might just split those things equally to avoid, uh, sort of to avoid conflict in some, in some ways. But if you feel really passionately about, like, no, I, I really wrote kind of more 75% of this, or I wrote all this, all you did was play drums. All right, then you need an agreement. You need some kind of paper trail, but, even if it's in But there's no... Right? But there's no rule of thumb that says, hey, if you wrote a lyric, no. then you're immediately entitled to 25%. Or if you, you know, if you wrote, uh, if you wrote yeah. all the bass parts and, and or the keys, then you're entitled to X percentage. When it comes to publishing splits, it's really just an agreement. Now look at U2. U2, they just split their mm -hmm. publishing four ways. They, there's no debate. Yep. They just, from the beginning, they just split it four ways, even though you know, Adam, the drummer, or whoever, like, may not have written anything. But they just felt that that was a fair way to do it, and that kind of reflected, and that it's worked for them. Uh, now, if you look at the police, that was always a <laughs> form of contention when between Sting and like the others, like who wrote what, and that's you know that's just it, it is a negotiation. It is just a discussion. Ideally, it happens early on, and it's memorialized in what is called a split sheet, and it's just a single piece of paper that says, "Hey, we agree that this song you take twenty percent, thirty percent, whoever," and but there are a couple, you know, definitely get uh, help of someone, of an expert, because there's some little nuances and and like regarding like administration of the copyright in terms of who gets the right to sign off on a sync agreement. Can you imagine if, you know, Josh and I wrote a song together, we were best friends back in the day, then we blew up, we made huge amounts of money, but we had a falling out. And there's a song that wants it licensed for this huge film. And if we're not getting along and we're not talking, suddenly, you know, that opportunity goes away because one of us doesn't have the right to sort of do the right. It's just, there's a lot of complexities around that. So these are, you try to anticipate, it's all good when we're not making money, but the moment, you know, uh, yeah. money comes into the picture, then suddenly everyone gets all, you know, defensive and, and it just, everyone's sort of eating, uh, biting at the bit. So yeah, it's really important to have those, that split sheets. When you, when you uh, registering on ASCAP and BMI, um, and all your, on your PRO, registering with Sound Exchange, which is which is where it's how you monetize and your uh, sort of your non-interactive uh, st uh, streams for uh, radio, digital radio, for example. Uh, registering with all, getting your house in order, registering everything, ensuring that you have whatever paperwork. If you have a session, a session drummer that came in, just play drums on on, on a song making sure that you have the proper side artist agreements or the work for hire agreement. So that's no one's ever going to come by and say, hold on a minute. You know, I owed, you know, you, owed, I, I never assigned you that the rights to that song because the underlying principle of a copyright law is he or she who creates owns until, you know, a couple things happen in the course of their employment or they assign it to somebody else, you know, it, but so using that premise, when you're in a studio and someone comes in to lay, out, lay down some trumpet tracks on a, get your paperwork in place. It's not that complicated as you're paying them for their time, you know, $500, $500 to come to a session and just make sure they sign up on that piece of paper. Assuming that that's the arrangement you have. Yep. Them. Um, so that is, right. that's you what don't is, have 500 bucks to or whatever. Yeah. And sometimes people, you don't have five. I've had clients who didn't have $500. Yeah. I'm like, Listen, I'll give you a piece of the publishing. It makes things complicated, yep. but you know, it's a way and then, to, that's right. Good, right? Because if you give them publishing instead of money up front, you're giving them life of copyright interest, and 10% gets you just as much approval rights as 90% does. So it's always important to keep in mind. And another thing you can look for when you're in those agreements, and some people put in the chat some, uh, some there are a few like kind of websites and stuff like that that can create templates for you. Also, a lawyer, if you if you work with a lawyer, will gladly make a a template for you that you can then use in subsequent writing sessions and just pay a lawyer once for that privilege. 
Um, I have. I will. We, we have a few different ones. That we, yeah. I'm happy to share. I oh, will sorry. share. I mean, I, I will happily share templates that I have that have worked for me. Split sheets, work for even side art. No problem at all. I don't mind. Um, and so I, yeah. I'll figure out with the Global Fest team like where I should share those and how I can get it out to you. But you can post it on the Global Fest site, download it for whomever. I, it's not a big deal at all. They're very standard. And yeah, it, it's, I'm happy to, I know that for Josh has some templates as well, but it's, uh, it, it's extremely yeah. important to get your house in order. Uh, and because it does ultimately, now there's, a, there's another bit of housekeeping that is relatively new. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. with regards to the MLC and mechanicals. I mean, there's a, there's a revenue stream there that, that we may not realize is available to you, especially if you own your, it might not be a lot, but especially if you own your own music. So uh, this is, you know, the US Copyright Board and Act has been modified to include a blanket license for mechanical royalty. So we talked about, I don't want to get too into weeds because suddenly it's gonna, I, so part of publishing copyrights involves two subsets of rights. One is called a public performance and one is called a reproduction. Just keep that in, your, in mind for now, but you basically need a license for each. So myself as a streaming service, we're like Spotify, if you will, we take public performance. So we have a license for the master, for the song itself that was recorded at that one period of time. And then we have a license for the publishing. And within the publishing license, there's two subsets. One's called the mechanical, the reproduction, one's a public performance. The MLC, it basically is a blanket license mechanism for mechanicals in the US. And it's meant to address a lot of the confusion that's been out there where if you didn't properly register, you weren't getting paid your mechanicals. So that's in a short form, there is an opportunity there and all artists, everyone should register with the MLC. Uh, Josh, I don't know if you've had any experiences what your thoughts on it, but I, you know, as yep. we're a service- I gets, love it. We use it as yeah, a publisher. Yeah, and we now as a music streaming service that's available in the US, we have a blanket license with the MLC for our service, which is extremely important because it's suddenly like, I don't have to worry about, oh my God, I gotta find the, the writer for this and I gotta find the writer for that track. It's just, I'm done. I'm paid. It might be more than yep. I might owe, but I'm done. it's that liabilities. I can sleep better at night. So yeah, don't... and there's something we talked about too. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Okay. Say, like, there's also this, yeah, this connection between streaming and sync, it's not always there, right? When we talk about sync licensing, the other thing is you're paid a fee up front. Most licenses these days, unless you're talking about for an ad or a trailer, uh, the terms of that license are gonna be what's called all media worldwide perpetuity, meaning next, it, where it used to be more siloed, like, oh, if this is on TV, we'll pay you a fee. If we make a DVD box set of it, you'll get another fee at that time. And if it goes to a streaming service, we'll pay you another, Thing, it will pay you another thing at that time because they didn't know that these things would exist, you know, when they first broadcast I Love Lucy or something, right? So, like, now there's a recognition that the technology moves quicker than the contract. Only took 100 years to figure that out. And uh, they, um, so oftentimes we will see, uh, or the vast majority of times, you'll just see all media, which means whether it exists or not, this license covers it worldwide or in the universe, even though there's no copyright on the moon and um, in perpetuity, meaning forever, a life of copyright. So um, they'll pay you one fee for that um, specific usage upfront. Um, and then these other royalty streams or performance royalties, mechanical royalties can result from um, either directly or indirectly from that license. You get performance royalties once the sync, say, airs on television. Um, and you'll get mechanicals if somebody shazams it and goes and streams it, right? That like those are, or buys a record or whatever it might be. So it's important to have all those things set up. But that question still of like, then, um, because like, especially if you're going to get syncs, you want people to be able to find the song, you want to be able to keep monetizing it. Most importantly, you want someone who might use the song again for another purpose. To, uh, to be able to find it, right? So you wanna be registered with a PRO with whatever territory you're in. So you have contact information. You wanna have contact information available on the internet. You wanna have a, a you know, like a, bi a bio on wherever it's publicly available that um, is informative. You know, oftentimes we'll see ones that are jokey one line things. I think it's also important for that. Um, I think that, um, but yeah, MLC, 
it's, 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 it's very similar. A lot of other countries have this set up already. Um, if, you know, if um, you're in the UK, you'd be a PRS and NCPS member where they're paying mechanical rights through one, performance rights through the other. Um, so the MLC is just a new concept in the States where they finally made that um, one body that is paid for by the streaming services. It's not a private enterprise in the way that the previous versions of it were. Um, and so it means there's less overhead, there's more money going directly back into music creators' pockets. It's a really good system and that hopefully they're gonna keep kind of improving it and going on. I, um, uh, oh, this the is, other thing I was gonna say is that- sorry, Go ahead, Josh. I'll this is, I think gonna get to one of these questions. Yeah, is that, um, I mentioned, you know, you get these all media worldwide perpetuity licenses, forever licenses, but they're rarely exclusive. They're most, the vast, vast, vast majority are non-exclusive. That's always something, if you're doing your own music licensing, you always wanna look out for that. Is this exclusive or non-exclusive? You always wanna see that language in writing in that license agreement that it's non-exclusive. Because what that means is it can be licensed for something else. Right? If someone wanted to license your song exclusively, they should be paying the amount of money that you think it is worth for no one else to ever be able to license that song again. So, and that's why they're very rare, um, but they do happen on occasion. And someone had asked, I noticed about, is the process for video games um, the same as film and TV or is it any different? Um, they're generally the same. The only thing that is different is the production timeline on a video game is they tend to take, you know, three to four years to produce. And so they are, it is harder to get music in a game because they tend to be very slow moving. And so, and there just aren't as many, there's not that quantity um, in terms of big games, but there is this emerging subset of indie games, right? Like we probably all, I bet everyone on their phone right now has some indie game on there that you play when you're waiting for the bus or whatever it might be, you know, <laughs> um, trying to distract yourself on your phone. Um, the, and there is there are a lot of um, libraries and companies out there who will um, who are starting to like collect music catalog to be able to license the indie gamers at like a flat rate. Um, and in sort of a music library model. Um, and so that's something else we wanted to talk about. It's like, I think those things are cool. And it does, like the technology has to move at the pace of, um, of the market. You know, like there is a point at which we can't be issuing, you know, a thousand licenses for a thousand indie video games for a hundred bucks a piece or something. But if somebody is systemizing that and making it a little more turnkey, it's easier for everyone involved. However, the only thing you want to be concerned with is again, making sure you're reading the fine print and having, and this is all kind of part of that thing about keeping your house in order, is making sure you understand some of these key terms and concepts or have people you trust to read them for you. You know, you're not, you're a music creator. You, it's reasonable to expect that you don't know all of the ins and outs of this, but there is somebody out there, there is a music publisher, there is a lawyer, there is a label, there is a third party licensing rep, there is a manager, right? Somebody in your orbit, at least one, who can often say that like doing it yourself doesn't mean doing it alone. There's sort of a DIY myth out there. You don't have to understand all this. You should understand the overarching concepts, but some other people have studied for years and years to really get the ins and outs of this um, business. But like, and looking at the terms of service of what looks like, oh, cool opportunity for my music might include weird rights grabs, right? Something where they want to license, okay, this is in this indie game. We're also giving the indie game rights to put it in the YouTube trailer for the game at no additional cost. We're also giving the, us the rights to then pitch it and use it in ads for our own service and at no additional uh, revenue for you. So those kinds of things are things you need to look out there and they're always there because as I often say, even when we talk about licensing, like at Terrorbird, our deals with our artists and labels, they have full approval rights. Meaning, so if they want to do something for free, gratis, they can, they can do that. If they want to get paid, we can go kind of shake the tree and see what money is there. But I always tell them, we want to know. We don't want them to just go off on their own and do their own licensing paperwork because we want to give, we want to use our licenses where we know the language that's in there as much as possible, or we want to vet the license that they receive. 
we don't want them to sign something, even if it's with a friend, because likely that friend hired a lawyer to draft paperwork. And that lawyer, their objective is I'm trying to make paperwork that is in my client's best interest. We would have the same thing on our side, right? So like you want to make sure that you that it doesn't mean your friend's trying to pull one over on you or anything like that, but you want to make sure someone's vetting that, vetting that paperwork for you and you understand the terms for which you're giving your music away, especially if it is for free or very little money. Josh, I wanted to address just a few questions for there's a from the creator community that's yeah. here. Uh, there was one uh, regarding, you know, you're, you've been asked to come on board and add some lyrics, chanting arrangements and other musical oh. arrangements to a song. What should we, should, are we entitled to a piece of the publishing to ask? Yes, you absolutely are. But it's, it's a subject of a discussion with the creator, with, with whoever hired you. If that is the under, they could very well say, we know that you wrote literally everything, but you're going to sign it to us uh, based on this particular piece of paper. We're going to pay you consideration for it. You're going to sign everything to us. And end of story. But yes, you're absolutely entitled to ask for you know, for a portion of publishing. Now, it, we don't know necessarily how much that is. There's no bright line rule, but uh, yeah, we, we absolutely can. Another question that uh, came on board, and I don't, you know what, Bill's great question about smart contracts. And it, I know that's going to, that's something that I don't know enough about. I just know that from a, generally from an attribution and reporting point of view, it's becoming increasingly important. Everyone's recognizing the value of being able to assign title to a song and, and have it exist and be able to, there's no confusion about who owns what, where, why, when. And it's a, it's a huge area. Uh, and I know we have about five minutes left. Do we, is there any particular other- Five minutes left? Yeah. Do we have any particular sort of, <laughs> I know we, there's a lot that we still wanted to discuss, but. Um, translating other songs to, um, to cover different languages. It doesn't, you know, ultimately translating, getting it doesn't change the underlying rights and ownership. It just happens to be translated. So it's still the same. So if you, you know, if you're using, let's say you can music match or any other of the services and you, if it gets translated into a different language, it's still the ultimate, the underlying copyright, the underlying publishing, the lyrics belong to you. Um, now, from a, if I am- And you might um, even have approval. I just want to chime in on that too. If you are covering songs and you speak another language, you, it's in your best interest to get the permission of the publisher. If you're doing a like for like reproduction of a song, you know, you're creating your own master recording of someone else's composition in the original language and you're not substantially changing the melody and lyrics. A, a translation is considered a substantive a substantial change. A lot of writers have approval rights written to their contracts for any translations. So most of them are enthusiastic about it. They want it. They want the songs to exist for other people to hear and appreciate. But oftentimes, right in the translation, it's rarely one to one. You know, you're changing something. You want to make that rhyme scheme work. You're trying to. So like you, you're going to probably make some changes. And for that, you might even get a piece of that. You know, of that song. It's just always worth vetting and reaching out. To a publisher even if it's a major um but for the most part it's you know yeah those the, the rights are still theirs they own them not not you that's a conversation so, have. here's um, a, a question that uh, you know can we what percentage of a song one second 10 second 30 seconds is there a rule that says how much of a song can we use and no the rule is you can you cannot use any percentage the idea that there's a seven second right. rule does not exist how about if i'm just a normal user on on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, how does am I governed by any of these? Uh, by yes, the, there are certain there, you do have certain guardrails that. But if you are user generated content that goes to the platform, ultimately the platform has to have their licenses in place. So if I'm whether I'm using uh, TikTok, Twitch, whatever, if they don't have those underlying licenses in place for the masters. And the, and the publishing, and they don't have the permissions to do it. They don't, the labels or the publishers haven't given them permissions to allow you, the user, to create that sort of, that derivative content, then that's a problem. And that will be taken down. I mean, we see it on YouTube all the time. Sorry, there's like bazillion amazing questions, but I'm, like, you know, I'm trying to get to all of them. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, oh, there, there are some questions too about, oh, 
Um, licenses for performing arts. Yeah, if you're a dance company or a musical and you need to get, uh, and you, you're incorporating other people's music into that production, you do need the rights. You will need to talk, if you're using the recording, you have to talk to the record label. If you're just using the composition, you will need to talk to the publisher. Uh, if you're using, I mean, if you're using the recording, you talk to the publisher and the label. Um, and yeah, and somebody asked that, that another thing about samples. We talked about getting your house in order. I don't know why I didn't say this like first thing out of my mouth. You need to disclose samples. Do not try to hide behind them. Do not try, there is no, uh, even something, fair use is a defense, not an entitlement. Um, as our lawyer once told us that you even, even in the case where you think like, I think I have the rights to this, you don't unless a court or, the, or all parties have affirmed that you do. So like the, it's very, very important because there is ultimately you're liable for your own uh, copyright infringements. So it's very, very important to not try to like sneak one past somebody. You know, it's really important if you're, if you're, you're affirming in a license agreement, you will always say, I have all the rights to enter into this agreement. So that would include certainly if you sample something and a sample is much different than a cover song because compulsory covers are allowed under copyright law, meaning you can cover a song and you own that recording, the publisher still gets their publishing. A master recording, th there's no inherent right to make a derivative work. Take 10 seconds of a song or one second of a song and use that, right? You could recreate a drum beat yourself and you own, that's not copyrightable as a composition, so you can own both outright, but you, you sample that same drum beat as a master recording and, uh, you're in violation of that record label's sound recording copyright. So, um, uh, blanket license, some, oh, everything counts as a sample, someone asked. So, um, yeah, and choreographers, yeah, we need contract with venues and there's rep representations and warranties. You, it's on you, usually. It's rare that the production is, uh, is covering that. It's rare that even their blanket licenses with the PROs, they're covering the performance of that. They not, may not necessarily, if you need grand rights for that performance, um, which is another thing, um, you'll need to get those from the publisher. And so your ASCAP BMI important. license, it's always, sorry, it doesn't also, it doesn't cover live stream, it doesn't even, co does not cover, necessarily cover live streams either. So, Jay, yep. yeah, just, sorry, I threw, remember that that's kind of a point that's come up before, like does my ASCAP BMI license cover me if I'm live streaming from my venue out into the ether? And no, it does not. It really depends on the platform through which it is streaming. I, I don't know how much time. Oh, pre-show, oh, pre-show playback. Oh yeah, yes. The pre-show playback, yes, yeah. it does cover. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but not on a live stream. But no, yeah, not on the live, yeah, right? not on live stream, but yeah, not on live stream, but yeah, in, yeah. House, venue, in house, yes. in house, yeah, yeah, within your, uh, I'm, yeah, the venue covers you just like TikTok would cover you, right? Like yeah. they should have the license, not you. It's unreasonable to expect you'd have your, D, you know, your whole record created if you're doing a DJ set, like license. So, uh, oh, someone asked about NFTs. I will touch on this for one second. Uh, like it's obviously a new and emerging thing. The music industry is famously slow at adapting to new technologies. I don't personally know how I feel about them in this space, but I, to me, like the two most compelling arguments for what comes next with those is that they are, uh, is to be used as merch items. And I, I could even see an environmental case being made for why to have them. Um, but smart contracts aren't the same as copyright. There usually is not a right to exploit within those um it usually is my understanding of them is that they tend to be um more just entitling you to that one thing that you own so i, I could see an environment residuals for, yeah, you know yeah. you know we're not gonna yeah like re, you know no residuals that like you're gonna that like instead of selling records and t-shirts because you don't want to put in more microplastics in the ocean you're gonna sell nfts cool but there still has to be a market for those things too Right? Like it's not gonna be right for everybody. It's just like when Radiohead put out their own rec, you know, like self-release and was like, you should do what Radiohead did. Like they already had 15 years of building a fan base before they did it. It's not really a fair one-to-one -one comparison. It's right for everybody. Yeah. Okay. We should uh, 
Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> give, the mic, give, the, give the mic back to them. Yeah, I think Ali, Josh, I just want to thank yeah. you both so much for this conversation. And, you know, it seems like there's a lot of active uh, conversations happening in the chat as well, uh, which we encourage to continue. Uh, and we will, you know, we're going to leave time uh, at, at five o'clock to sort of continue these conversations uh, for anyone who'd like to uh, join us for that meet and mix and you know have sort of an open forum uh conversation but i do just want to thank you both so much for this and also for the informative uh you know powerpoint presentation that i think yeah, was great. you know was was, was truly uh, a great way to get a quick deep dive into this whole issue so and, and all these uh opportunities so thank you both